raise your hand if you are not a math person, right? Regardless of how you responded, we can't skip past the fact that humans really do enjoy solving problems. I mean, seriously, by show of hands, how many of you have played Wordle at some point this past month? Right? A lot of us. Yeah, yeah. But despite this fact, the very subject which lays out our foundations of logic and problem solving is struggling in our school systems right now. And what I'm referring to is math. According to the 2018 Program for International Student Assessment, and more specifically, the math report from that exam, the United States places 38th best of the 79 participating countries. But more importantly, this has been on a downward trend since the year 2003. And if you see this graph and you think to yourself, well, aren't we getting better each year because the graph is going up? And thank you for proving my point. I don't see this data as a representation of a competition between countries. I see it as a problem. The National Association for Educational Procurement tells us that all students by eighth grade, for half of them, they've lost their confidence in mathematics. And when I was doing my research, I looked into the data for 12th grade. They didn't even report confidence levels by that point. I'm guessing they realized that by the time students were exiting their calculus classes, they were just thinking to themselves, well, I guess I don't have the math gene. And just like that, they abandoned X and Y. This was my story. Now, my name is Corey Perdall. And when I was in seventh grade, and I know what you're thinking, this hairstyle is for kind of another TED talk itself. <laughs> I had gotten a C plus in my pre-algebra class. I hated this symbolic system with a true burning passion. And it was probably an actual goal of mine never to touch numbers again after school. But later on down the road, something in mathematics clicked for me. I became a straight A math student, but more importantly, I learned to genuinely love the subject. I mean, literally, this is my bookshelf. And if you were to ask any of my teachers or friends or family, they'd always say I'm carrying one of these books around. So I can't just ignore this trend of not being a math person, not even really because I enjoy math, but because I know that math can change our world in every dimension. Autonomous vehicles, space missions, cryptography, they all stem from our fundamental understanding of arithmetic. So I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, I can help you all understand the current issues in our mathematical curricula and how we can change the narrative around numbers to get students genuinely excited about the potential of mathematics. And I wanna start by asking you all a question. Please raise your hand if you have seen this at some point in your school career, right? We've all seen this. This is the most legendary math theorem of all time, which is the Pythagorean theorem. The fact that for a right triangle, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. But I have a more important question to ask you all, which is to please raise your hand if you can tell me why or how this theorem works, right? Almost no one. And this isn't necessarily surprising to me because this is how we learn math in our school systems. We learn math as a set of memorized formulas. We're told this is how you solve the solutions of a quadratic as the teacher proceeds to write up this crazy formula on the whiteboard, right? And so many students will just look at the whiteboard and write it down without ever taking a moment to ask themselves, why is this happening? What's going on here? Why does this work? And so by the afternoon, it's homework time. So they'll get out their notebook, open up their notes and look at the formula and they'll plug the numbers in from their homework into the notes. Sound familiar? And then you rinse and repeat. And then you get through an entire math education without understanding why that certain topic works. And in my opinion, a math education like this is just such a grand disservice to the subject, especially since the proof, or should I say proofs, to the Pythagorean theorem are all very interesting. So this first point that I already sort of touched upon is the fact that we don't have the time to ask why in our math classes. And in a moment, I'm going to show you how substantial the difference can be in knowing the answer to this question versus not knowing the answer to this question. So I'm going to display a sequence of 10 numbers on the screen. And what I want you all to do is to the best of your ability, memorize these 10 numbers. I'm gonna give you all about 10 seconds to do so. So just try the best you can. Ready, go. All right, done. Now, raise your hand if you can tell me all 10 numbers. Not too, too many hands, I see a couple. And this isn't necessarily surprising because, first of all, I mean, memorizing 10 pieces of information in 10 seconds is difficult, but 
More than that, this reminds me of our math classes because we're always told to memorize information that has really no meaning to us. And why would your brain even try to encode information if you have no use for it in the real world? In fact, I'm guessing all of you were so focused on memorizing the numbers that you didn't even realize that there was a common difference of seven. All the numbers were in increasing order of seven. So in other words, if you took any two numbers and you subtracted the two, you would get seven as their difference. That's pretty funny. And especially since the fact that, I mean, if you think about this, you really only have to memorize three pieces of information instead of 10. In this case, you really now only have to memorize the starting number, this common difference of sorts, and the ending number, which is 106, right? So knowing this, having asked this question of why, I want us to try one more example. And this time, we actually have an optimized method for learning it. There will be a common difference, so try to look for it and try to memorize more terms this time. Ready? Go. All right, done. So raise your hand if you feel like you might have memorized more terms this time than the last time, right? Much more hands are being raised. How many of us saw that we had to add 11 to get to the next number, right? So we really only had to memorize those three pieces of information instead of 10. And because we understand the sequence, it's so much more easy to remember. When we understand how something works, it's easier to remember. But there's actually a reason why knowledge in this form is even more important. Think about popcorn for a second. Now, if you're trying to make popcorn, you could just read the back of a popcorn container for the instructions, but then you're strictly limited to that one way of making popcorn. But if you actually knew how popcorn popped, if you knew that by heating up the kernel, then the water inside would expand, causing the kernel to burst, and the starch inside would inflate, think about how much more you can do with that understanding. I mean, first of all, you'll be able to make popcorn in many different ways, but more importantly, you'll be able to innovate with that knowledge. In fact, a man by the name of Percy Spencer took his knowledge and his understanding of popcorn and combined it with his professional work revolving around electrochemical oxidation mechanisms and created microwavable popcorn. So I hope it's clear by now that one simply couldn't just go from reading the back of a popcorn container to being able to combine it to something as complicated as that, right? You'd have to know popcorn pretty in and out in my opinion. And I also see the difference in these two types of knowledge at my job. I work as a instructor slash teacher at an after school program where we basically teach kids ages seven to 14 how to code. And the basic premise is that there's this curriculum that we have all the students work through. Um, and the way it works is they'll read about a passage in computer science, whether that be recursion or for loops or iteration. And then they'll make a game based off of that topic. Except the reality is really that you can go through this curriculum two different ways. You can either actually read the passages for the purpose of understanding and ask the questions of why and how, or you can just look at the code that's in the curriculum and copy it down onto your own computer for the purpose of being done quicker. So I thought to myself one time, how dramatic is this difference in learning? So I went up to the whiteboard in the computer room and I wrote down the first few numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. And here's what that looks like. The first two numbers are zero and one, and every number after that is defined by the sum of the previous two numbers. So for example, the number two is just one plus one, then three is just two plus one, and then five is three plus two, and so on and so forth. And once I wrote down these, this sequence of numbers on the whiteboard, I prompted all the kids with this challenge, which is to make an algorithm which takes an integer input n and returns the nth Fibonacci sequence number. So the basic idea is that I would be able to type number six into the kid's code, and then the code would return the number eight to me because eight is the sixth element of the Fibonacci sequence. And as kids were coding, I realized something. I realized that for the kids who always asked the questions of why and how, how things worked all the time, why this happened, those were the kids who created algorithms in literal minutes one kid actually created an algorithm in under a minute, which ran in an optimal runtime, which is crazy in my opinion. But for the kids who just copied down the code from the curriculum onto their own computers, they were not able to come up with a solution. So there is this difference in learning. There's a difference between the brain that accesses information through memorization 
versus the brain that accesses information through understanding. The brain that understands will be the brain that can use mathematics to launch rockets, create optimized GPS systems, and perhaps even find solutions for something like climate change. Another problem I see in our mathematical curricula revolves around the content. I will never forget, one of the most spectacular books I've ever read was a book called The Art and Craft of Problem Solving by Paul Zietz. And the basic premise is that Paul Zietz gives the reader some creative problem solving abilities by introducing them to a series of mathematical puzzles. And I'll never forget, in one of the very first few pages of the book when Paul Zietz is going over the outline of the book, he makes this distinguishment between an exercise and a problem. And just by show of hands, when you see this, I mean, how many of us think that this is a math problem, right? Probably a lot of us do, because this is what we always saw on our algebra homework. But Paul Zietz argues that this is not a math problem, but a mere exercise, because you know how to solve it from the instant you see it. All you really have to do is execute the same algebraic processes you wrote down in your notebook. And even if you didn't know how to solve this problem, you would just know to revert to your notes or maybe look up Google for the answer. So in reality, your brain really doesn't have to expand or think creatively to come up with a solution. So no wonder math is so boring for so many individuals. I mean, seriously, this is what a typical middle school homework assignment looks like. I remember I would get back from school, middle school, and be like, all right, time to do my homework. Looks like I got to solve for x, and then I got to solve for x again, and then I got to solve for x again, and then, oh, I get to solve for a, right? The difference between the exercise and the problem is that for the exercise, you know how to solve it from the instant you see it. There's a straightforward process or some memorized process that you can have that will help you in coming to the solution. But for problems, you actually have to think creatively in order to come up with a solution. It's so much more valuable to prompt students with problems like this. Why is x squared plus x all divided by 2 a whole number for any whole number you plug in for x? So you might experiment with this for a second. You might think to yourself, OK, what if I plug in 2 and it ends up being a whole number in the end. If you plug in four, you get four squared, 16 plus four is 20, you divide by two, you get 10, a whole number. And then for, if you plug in five, you get 15. So you notice that for any number you plug in, you really do get a whole number as a result. So you have to prove why this is true. This is a problem because there's no straightforward way to solve it. But I chose this one because the way you actually go about solving this problem is just like any other solve for X problem. You just have to think about it in a different way. And as much as I'd love to go over the specific elements of this problem, I wanted to focus on one that everyone's going to be able to follow. Because I want to show everyone that solving problems actually does require a certain level of creativity. So I chose this one, which is, what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus so on and so forth up until 1,000? So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I can solve this. I'll just go maybe write it down or plug it into my calculator. I would hope that's not what you're thinking, unless you want to be pounding away keys on your calculator for the entire day. Um, so instead, we need some creative method to solve this problem. So upon experimentation, a problem solver would see that you have to add the sequence to itself. And then the problem solver might think to themselves, it might be useful to reverse the order of the second sequence. And then upon observation, you might see that if you add 1 to 1,000, that gives you 1,001. If you add 2 to 999, that gives you 1,001. If you add 3 to 998, it gives you 1,001. And then you realize for every number that sums with its vertical pair, it just gives you 1,001. So we've just turned this problem into a way easier problem, which is what is 1,001 plus 1,001? A certain amount of times. You might ask, what is that certain amount of times? Well, there's 1,000 elements in the original series, so it's just 1,001 times 1,000. And that is not our final answer, because that is what double the sequence looks like. So if you actually wanted to get the value of just one sequence, the 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus so on to 1,000, you would just divide it all by 2. So like I mentioned earlier, the exercise can be solved using a straightforward memorized process. The problem can't be. In fact, what makes problems so great is the fact that you have to create a sequence of mathematical reasoning to do so. You have to play around with the numbers. You have to experiment. You have to then conjecture a realization you make. And then you have to actually prove your conjecture. So, And that's what gives a young mathematician 
the confidence is when they actually have to back up their own claim. So my question is, why do we use exercises in our school systems instead of problems? Finally, math is set up to be disrespected because very few school systems actually subject their kids to the applied world of math. It's like I mentioned earlier, why would your brain ever try to remember a piece of information if it has no applicable use for that information to the real world? And so many students will just go through an entire math class, right? And then they'll get out and they'll know something like calculus without knowing how calculus actually connects itself to the real world. Students are always told to plug numbers into functions without ever knowing that, plug, that functions themselves are the very things that govern every software and application we use. Students are always told to solve for angle ABC without knowing that solving for angles is the only thing that allows people to feel remotely confident about embarking on something like a space mission, right? Our curricula are always so focused on solving for X and never focused on what X can be. So by the time a student gets to high school, they've given up. They've decided they don't have the math gene and they completely disregard a subject that is helping decide the fate of our world. One of my favorite math professors, who is the uh, coach of the United States Mathematical Olympiad team, right after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, he created this app called Novid. And what he did is he gathered his student mathematicians and his student computer scientists, and they all came together and created this platform that used combinatorics and machine learning to tell you how many social groups you are away from getting the pandemic. When I was listening to him talk about this platform on a podcast once, all I could think to myself were just two things. I was first of all so excited by how brilliant a solution this was to ending the pandemic, but so sad that it only had 120,000 downloads because probably the rest of the millions of Americans wouldn't understand how it worked. And that's just because they weren't introduced to math knowing it's everywhere in our world, both today and tomorrow. When we enter a language class, we know how important it is to learn a language. It's gonna help us speak to people in other countries. When we study history, we study war, politics, governance, and society, trying to learn lessons from the past that will help us create a better future. My question is why aren't we told at the beginning of our math classes that Isaac Newton used math to create a method to predict the future? So how do we fix this? How do we get students genuinely excited about the potential of mathematics? The solution first comes with understanding how complicated of a system this is to reform. We absolutely should not point fingers at teachers because teachers have standards set by institutions. And we shouldn't point fingers at institutions because institutions have usually standards set by something like a common core, which is nationally adopted. Instead, I say we start by respecting changing the narrative around math. Learn math for the sake of being able to solve a problem using limited resources. Geometry doesn't have to be the study of angle chasing. It can be the study of using little known facts to build larger arguments. And notice that that's one of the most important skills for a writer to have. Calculus does not have to be the study of finding the area under the curve. It can be the study of abstracting information into different forms. And notice that that's one of the most useful skills an artist can have when they're trying to capture emotion into their songs and their paintings. Math doesn't have to be the study of numbers, but instead the study of logical thinking, which is important for every single human on Earth, given the fact that we probably make about 35,000 decisions a day. Finally, I'm going to leave you with this. We need to spread the word about the beauty and importance of numbers in our everyday world. We need to break the understanding that math is biological. We need to believe that any math problem can be solved with a finite amount of effort. Everyone is the result of the communities and families they grew up with. I know that at my job, one of the best things I can do is if a kid is up at the whiteboard and they're drawing instead of coding, I know that kid likes to draw. So rather than telling them to get back the, to code, we can change the narrative and ask the kid, why don't we turn your drawing into a robot? Thank you.